other than that. Middle school. Middle school concept and middle level program. It's important that we understand what that is. And, and I think many of us believe we need to work with that, including our teachers and our administrators. The current state of our middle school, from my perspective, we really have a middle school. We have a seventh and eighth grade that are at Toronto. We refer to that group of grades as a middle school, but we don't really have a middle school program. Now I want to make sure I'm really clear about this. We have teachers that spend some time with seventh and eighth grade teachers at the Toronto. We have teachers who get what middle school programming is. And they've been really interested and excited about thinking about creating a middle school. Things here from the eighth grade, she's done some terrific work, she's on that team. Um, and it was, it was really exciting to hear folks talk about middle school and that because of the, we've got a very, I'm getting a little ahead of myself, but the Tahama schedule is one of the reasons why we really haven't been able to pull off a middle school. It's a very traditional high school schedule. We take elementary students in the sixth grade, we move them up to Tejanto, and all of a sudden they're in the seven period of day, six day cycle. It's very, um, you know, you go from chemistry, not chemistry, but you go from English to math to gym. It's very, you know, kind of broken up, which is, which is what all the researchers say is exactly not what middle schoolers need. They need integrated, they need interdisciplinary. So we want to talk a little bit about that. Um, and some of the things that we are beginning to do with extracurricular activities that support middle school. Athletics is actually one of the issues that, that people talk about when they say, I'm worried about what happens to my sixth grader when they go to the Honto. Because they end up in physical education classes where juniors and seniors can't have it. That is absolutely got to stop. Mike Barker's here, the, the new principal of the Honto, already taking major steps to stop that action. We can't have middle schoolers and high schoolers participating really in any class, let alone physical education. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that. Okay. So this is kind of the context of what I'm going to try to talk about, hopefully go on a little bit. And we'll that. So why are we here? First of all, EPRSD, that's up, Berlin Boyles and Regional School District, is lacking a true middle school. One of the handouts over there actually describes what a true middle school is and what the critical characteristics are of a middle school. The under schedule and grade configuration has hindered the desire of implementation of middle-level programs. Um, Cheryl Nelson, who's uh, our administrative assistant up at uh, Central Office, she's great. She pulled out this report in 1994, implementing the middle school. It had a lot of things in there about some of the latest thinking of middle school. We're not doing it. We, we really are, the district really is about 15, 20 years behind in the implementation of a true middle school. So when I saw this report, it's not that we haven't thought about it before, so we just haven't been able to pull it off. Um, and again, it's not the teachers, it's, I take responsibility, it's the administration. Um, but we, we need to take ownership of that. But it was interesting to see that report in 1994. Regardless of the building project, we strongly believe in the need to create a middle school program that include a, includes students ages 10 to 15. That's kind of the accepted age group. Now 10 is kind of fifth grade, sixth grade. Um, we're talking about sixth grade. One of the more common collections of grades for middle school is six, seven, eight. There are many middle schools that are five, six, seven, eight. We're not talking about fifth grade. We're talking about six, seven, eight. Ideally, sixth grades, ideally, my perspective, and many of us in the district, um, for us, grades six through eight are in the same physical space, so the middle level programming would be the most efficient and effective that we could offer. One of the things that the teachers have said is it would be great if the middle school collection of teachers could get together and really think about this collection of students that they really have responsibility for. It's one of the key things about middle school is that you've got a collection of adults that are working with a collection of young adolescents. Um, and again, the schedule doesn't run out for that to happen. You folks do a really great job of trying to work around that. Uh, but we're, the schedule is one of the issues that we've got. The new building construction provides an opportunity to appropriately design an educational space that supports middle level programming. Middle level programming. A middle school with its own identity, its own focus, its own mission, and its own vision. And that's really, again, regardless of what happens in the sixth grade, we need to do that. We need to have an understanding of what middle school is, and we need to have a plan for making all middle school students be in middle school. Um, and if we, can, if we can take the opportunity that we have in this building and actually design the building, a school within a school, a separate space for middle school, a place that teachers can collaborate, students can do project-based learning, a whole variety of things. We design it from scratch. 
will end up with a really terrific educational environment for disabled. The creation of a six-day middle school, including the sixth grade in Tahanto, requires a change in the regional agreement. So the regional agreement for Tahanto counts are voted to on a 7 to 12 region. In order for us to expand that to include the sixth grade, we need both towns to say yes. So we have to come to you and say, here's what we're proposing. We'd like for you to support us expanding the region to a 6 to 12 instead of a 7 to 12. If Boyles and votes yes, Berlin votes no, it doesn't happen. If Berlin votes yes, Boyles and votes no, it doesn't happen. So both towns have to vote positively for this one. The other question that people ask, if it doesn't go, if we don't get support for the 6th grade, what happens to the building project? There are some folks that say, from Boyle's land, we've got some Boyle's and folks here, we can chime in if you want, that if the 6th grade doesn't go, the building project won't go. There are some folks in Berlin who say, if the 6th grade does go, then the building project won't go. So, I don't know. Um, I'm hoping we get both. But why are we really here? First, to let you know that we now acknowledge that our school system has not provided our students, your children, with a true middle school. We haven't done it. There's an attempt to do it, we just have to pull it off. Second, to let you know that we are absolutely committed to doing this. We need a middle school. We need a program that pays attention to this age group of students. That supports the teachers that are trying to do this. Third, we're asking that you work with us to fulfill this commitment and that you hold us accountable for completing this commitment. And fourth, this is a tough one because you don't really know a lot of this. We've got, we've got three administrators that are here for two years. We've got a brand new high school principal. We don't have a track record in folks. So we are asking you to trust that we are now, we are asking you to support this because we honestly believe this is in the best interest of the towns, it's in the best interest of the schools, and we believe it's in the best interest of the students. We do honestly believe it. But we don't, we don't really know whether or not we're going to pull this off. And unfortunately, the timing is not well. I've said this a number of times. I wish we had about a year and a half before we had to bring to you the notion of voting to include the sixth grade so that you can see what we're trying to do. We've already changed the schedule. We're already pulling the middle schoolers out of the physical education classes with the high schoolers. Um, we're already trying to you know, provide support for the middle school teachers. We, we talked a little bit earlier about how we've got sixth grade and seventh grade and eighth grade students going off to a conference together. So we've begun to think about middle school, middle level programming, how that works and how that operates. Um, it'd be nice if we had a little bit more time. Unfortunately, we don't. Uh, so we are asking you to trust us. So a few updates. Uh, let me just throw all these up here. Um, there's a there's an updated site plan in the back that talks about where we are with the building project. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on that because I really want to get to the conversation about the middle school. I will let you know that the state continues to support the building project. We are expecting to get about 50 percent reimbursement from the state for the building project. The building committee, the, the state has decided that it's going to be a new building, and not a renovation. In fact. What the state was provided with in terms of information is it would cost more to renovate the existing than it would to build a new. So the state said build a new. It wasn't really our decision, but we provided the information and architects did. The other thing the building committee did was they decided to put the building right about where the baseball and the soccer fields are. So on the east side, which the nice part about that is it means that we can isolate that construction area, keep all of that construction away from the existing schools, students can go to school all year long and the construction um, activity won't bother them. So, and we believe we can fit all the athletic fields, including a, a real track, which would be nice since we have real tracking. And we have cross country too, but I guess they don't do that. So, if you want more about that, there's also handouts, like a candle over there that gives you a high level of where the, the building project is. Um, to the extent you want to talk more about the building project, you know, ask me, or maybe a little later when we've got questions, you can ask questions about the project. Special town meetings. There'll be two special town meetings. Actually, I shouldn't say that. There'll be two town meetings, for sure. Um, we're assuming, at the very least, there'll be a special town meeting in early November for each of the towns. And that'll be solely to ask you to support the vote for the sixth grade. So it's coming up in about a month. There'll be 
be another town meeting, and I say I'm not sure, sure it's a special town meeting because it may be during the annual town meeting, although there are a number of folks that say, no, let's keep that separate. Let's keep building project vote separate from the annual town meeting. The first town meeting is about the sixth grade vote. The second town meeting will be asking for the funding of the building project. We have to go to the state by the beginning of December with the proposed schematic design. The state then says, yes, that's a good schematic design. You can now go to your towns and ask for funding. If they say yes, and we pass that hurdle, we have 120 days to come back to both towns, say, here's the project, here's how much it's going to cost, here's what it's going to look like, and we're asking you to go for it. There will still be some design, uh, some opportunities to adjust design after the NSHPA says yes. Um, but for the most part, we'll certainly have a pretty hard number for how much it's going to cost. Right now, we're hoping, our goal is to keep it under $40 million. We think we can get it to $35 million for brand new building. Now, one of the things I was talking about early, early on is that this building was going to be about a $20 to $30 million building. When the MSBA gave us those estimates, it didn't include design costs, soft costs, and it didn't include the project manager. So there were some things that they didn't include when they provided the district with estimates of the building. Um, we were talking about um, the state of the, the state and the economy earlier and um, why the 2011 budget is really a nightmare. Um, probably the only sort of good news about that in the economy is that the bids that are coming in for building construction projects are a whole lot lower than they have been in the last four or five years. So if we actually get this through now um, and we get through January, we have a chance to come in with some bid uh, prices that can really allow us to build a good building for, relatively speaking, um, <coughs> price. Um, if we miss this track, then the rates are always go up. Does that price include all of the athletic fields and all the furniture? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, the state actually reimburses only a, a certain amount of percentage of the total project for athletics, for athletic fields. At one point, the state said that they were going to support reimbursing, and it's really for them, it's really about what is it that we'll reimburse. So if you, if you pay $100 for this thing, we'll give you 50 um, In some cases, they say, you can pay $100 for that, we're not giving you anything for that. So it depends on what's on their reimbursable list. Initially, they were going to reimburse for all athletic fields, bleachers, scoreboards, all that stuff. There was a point in time, a little bit further down the road, they said, we're not supporting any athletic field, you've got to pay for it on your own. They got all kinds of very angry community members at the doorstep. They said, okay, we'll pay for athletic fields, but we're not going to pay for bleachers, school boards, and so on. They won't. And they've adjusted the percentage. They started at 7, they're now at 8%. So they will reimburse 8% of the total project for athletic fields. So we've got a whole lot of athletic fields on that site plan. One of the things that we're going to have to figure out is, so how much is 8%, which is what the state will reimburse? And how much above that do we want to do? How much will the towns be willing to pay for? What we're anticipating doing is kind of prioritizing and saying, these are the things we absolutely want the state to reimburse. And we'll get those on the list. And then we'll have all this. And if the bids come in a little bit lower and we can afford additional things in our third field, we'll try to bring those in. But that's one of the questions that's going to be coming up. And one of the reasons why the prices on the original estimates for the projects came in really high is because the architects included all of that. And there was, I think it was about 12 or 13% of the total project was athletic mm -hmm. fields. So we knew that there was going to be a good chunk of money that was coming off of the top of all those athletic fields. So given this, the rough schematic that you have right there, and given an 8% reimbursement, what would the total cost of the project be with furniture and athletic fields? Um, it, it's, right now, we've got a range of about 31, well, one of the numbers was 29, but um, we don't know that that's really appropriate. We got a range of about 31 to about 36. Um, there's one project that's got 560, which includes the sixth grade, and we've got the square footage down. We have to do a little more work. That's 34 eight, so about 35 million. So you were including the other. Yes. Oh, sorry. Yes, I was. And that, and that estimate was, and what I was including. I don't, I don't know if we were including in total all those fields. I know that most of those were in there. We weren't at the eight percent. So there was additional cost in there. Probably two hundred million dollars of athletic fields that were above the eight percent. So we can even bring that down and peel some of that off. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, and they'll take two months to actually approve it. So their meeting is right in the agenda. Can they just approve it? Yeah. And what does that mean? It 
these, they have, they have uh, specific meeting dates. So if we go into January meeting, there's another one in March. If we don't make the March, there's not one in February. If we don't make the March one, um, I think there's one in April. And I think there's one more before kind of the summer hiatus. So if we do it in December and they don't approve it, we come back and fix it and then put it in again? If, if they allow us to. They have a huge number of projects they're trying to get through this really narrow funnel of their needs. And if we go in, if we go in with a project that's missing one or two things, then they'll probably say, go back and fix these and get ready for the next one. If we go in with a project that's saying, this is way off what we think it's going to be, it's going to be you know, um, much more than we expect it to be, you're done, come back next year. The architects, the ability of uh, project managers who are working with NSDA to make sure that we know what it is that NSDA is asking for. Um, and also, the project manager really should be working with the architects to keep the price down um, and to make sure that what it is that they're planning is legitimate for our program and all of that. So it's really a three way it's the project manager, the architects, and us who are really running shop in the zone. Okay? We should go back to the project. I'm sure there's a lot of questions. Uh, three more last questions. Finances. Will it cost more to educate sixth grade students if they are at the Honda? Um, so we did a whole variety of things with financial analysis. And we looked at expenses that were transferred from the elementary schools to the Honda. So essentially what happens is we've got money in line items in the elementary schools that if the sixth grade goes up, all of those expenses go up. Staffing, teacher salaries go up. Instructional materials go up, all that stuff. Whatever it is that we pay for sixth grade, we end up at the top. So we looked at salaries, structural expenses, health insurance and staff, we looked at, we looked at transportation, and we looked at state funding. Um, so throughout all of that, so we're talking about a $3 million budget in Burlington Market. We're talking about a $3.2, $3.3 million budget in Boylston. In all of that, we're talking about maybe a $16,000 swing. And that's actually less than sixty thousand dollars less of expenses overall. So that's about it. Now that's dependent on the percentage of students that are at the Honda. So that's not, and that could change. Like if all of a sudden Brown has thirty-five students, thirty-five percent of students into Honda, the percentage is shift. So for the most part, it's not a financial impact. It won't cost more to have a sixth grade at Honda. Um, one of the things that's interesting, and here's some of the numbers that I've got, and they're in there. Um, one of the interesting things, one of the interesting ways of thinking about it is, right now, we've got two sections in Berlin, we've got three sections in Boston. So essentially, Berlin is paying for 40% of the sixth grade. And Boston is paying for 60% of the sixth grade. And two or five. But the percentages, based on that number of students, It is that overall, Berlin pays 34% of the education that happens in the Honda, and Boylston pays 66% of what happens in the Honda. So it turns out that when the sixth grade goes to the Honda, Berlin will actually end up paying less. But we're not talking about a lot of money. Again, it's like $16,000. So out of a multiple million dollar budget, it's really not a lot. Another yeah. question. With the proposal of the sixth grade going up in the middle school structure, are you planning on hiring as principal staffing for that, or is it all going to fall into one school? Great question. We don't know. <laughs> <laughs> um, that would impact your costs, would it? Yeah, absolutely. What we do know, what we do know, is that given what we are thinking about middle school education, middle school program, we have to have somebody paying attention from an administrative perspective on that program. We don't know if it might be a half-time administrator. We don't know if it will be a piece of a teacher that's already there. So we don't really know. We did actually include about $45,000 of the possible expense for a half-time administrator to see whether or not um, that would do it. But we don't, we don't really have, there are a lot of schools that are a whole lot bigger than Tahanto with the 6th through 12th grade that have one principal and one assistant principal. But we think we need a separate focus on the middle school. So we do know we need to do that. But we haven't gone that far enough down the road to know just exactly how that's going. 
Yeah. Is that only the student, uh, the cost per student that's going down? Because it's not the overall budget would change differently than that. The overall budget would change. But what happens is Berlin pays, based on the number of Berlin students that are at Tahanta, actually, based on the number of Berlin students that are in public schools at Tahanta level, so including choice students that live here and trust around. Berlin is 34% of the population, Wellesley is 66% of the population. So when we have the total budget for Tahanta, we split it up that way. Right. That's what the assessment is. But isn't the budget going to change because we at BMS will lose two teachers? Those salaries? You're absolutely right. The budget, the budget in Berlin Memorial is going to go down. The budget in Wellesley Elementary will go down. The budget in Tahanta will go up. But what happens is when it comes to the town, we have the town for support for the elementary budget. We have the town for support for the Tahanta budget. So even though it's a transfer of the request from the elementary schools to the hospital, it still comes to the town. But now you still have the maintenance of the building here. Yes. Which part of that money is, is allotted per student for that, isn't it? Uh, you know, what, what we didn't do is, the only thing that we, that we um, thought about that would change would be the instructional line items. We assumed that the that Berlin Memorial would continue to pay the amount they're paying out for custodial services, yeah. for electrical services, for all, all those, those fixed costs that are in the building that aren't attached to it. So we assumed all those would stay. So we didn't reduce the budget by any of that, just the instructional costs that we moved. The building. A lot of people have asked, so if you move the sixth grade up, then how much more is the building going to cost? How much more will there be in the building if we have a sixth grade? Um, once again, we've got this 34 and 66 percent. We've got a you know, there's a, there's a, it's only 2 percent. It's really a wide range. The architects think that it's somewhere between 2 and 4 percent of the total building that we would pay for a particular grade. But what they really didn't consider was, well, you're still going to have a gym, you've got to pay for that. You're still going to have a cafeteria, you've got to pay for that. You're still going to have all the campus systems, you've got to pay for that. So, but even though that's the numbers they gave us, I took right in the middle of that, 3% of the $35 million project would cost them approximately a um, million dollars more to put the six grade in there. So we get 50% back from the state. So it will essentially cost $500,000 to the towns. So if you take those percentages, which is also how we're doing capital, to the town of Berlin, it'll cost $170,000 more in that building project. Boylston will cost $130,000 more in that building project. Yeah. 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 So that's substantial money. That's more. But there are a couple of important notes to consider. It is expected that with this move, Berlin Memorial would not need any more substantial capital renovation on this building in the foreseeable future. It has also been determined that for both BMS and BES, there is a critical acquisition for both BMS and BES. We don't expect either elementary school, we need any more capital additions. It has also been determined that for both elementaries, there is a critical need for additional space, food support services, special education, ELL, remedial services, that we're actually bumping up to now. We've got people who are in elementary school that provide services in places that used to be that were designed for storage costs. We were struggling, we've got computer lessons no longer here. And it's here, but it's not in that room anymore. Because of the additional space is needed for these additional services that were not considered in these buildings were designed. So even though our class sizes are actually phenomenal, we're still, we still need smaller rooms. So the movement of the sixth grade out of this building would give us the capability to provide model services in appropriate spaces. It would limit the possibility of capital expenditures for either elementary school or the foreseeable future. And that's the part that we think is beneficial to the town. Right. I have a distinct feeling that the only design of the building will be specifically to house school choice students. Now, do we get different reimbursement if the school is going to be for school choice students? We don't. There was a time when, and I even talked about this earlier on. <coughs> There was a time when the NSBA, when they were trying to figure out whether or not it was going to be a renovation or a new building, the NSBA actually said, we will not build for space that you have for your school or students. So 
So in Toronto, we've had anywhere from like, I don't know, 80, 85, up to mid-90s school choice students. So they were willing to take off the top of those number of school choice students and say, that's the biggest building we'll build you. But one of the things that happened, through the process of MCDA taking on the our enrollment, our projections, our history, the fact that in both Burlington and Boylston over the last couple of years, at Berkeley, which has done a nose job, they took all of that into consideration, potential developments, um, took all that into consideration, and because of the number of students that we have that are going to school in other places, which they also took into consideration, they said it's okay for us to, um, if the towns vote for it, we will support building a building for 560 students, which would house the sixth grade plus 80 school choice students. What we're hoping to do is that when we have this building, we're actually keeping more Berlin and Boston students in town, and we would reduce the number of school choice students. Right now, we have too many school choice students. It's costing us to have that many school choice students. We should really have about 60, 65 school choice students. Then the finances are a benefit to us. Above that, which is where we are now, we're actually paying for a little bit of school choice students. We have to manage that better. The MSBA understands all of that, and they're actually encouraging us to do that. Um, when they heard that there were, we need to manage the school choice students, they said, that's what we need, need to hear from you. Last year, I think we had 92 at the hospital. This year, we have 80. Um, we're starting to go down. The bad news is the timing. The budget is so lousy, and that's a good chunk of money that we're now not bringing in revenue. But we continue to maintain that and increase school choice. It's just a bad spiral. So at some point, we just got to kind of, you know, bite that bullet and, and begin to manage school choice, which we're getting into. So we spent a, spent a lot of time thinking about school choice and whether or not we don't want to ask the towns to support building for school choice. Um, so. What is the average percentage that they gave you for growth to build to? Um, like per, per, per grade? Like, per let's say 560 students. Yeah. Do, is that a, any of that percentage for growth, like people moving the town projects? No, they assume that we'll be able to manage that within the 560, mainly because of the collection of school choice students. So if we have 80 developers that come into the town, we'll take that 80, those 80 school choice students and back those up so that we have room for the residents. It's much better for us to have resident students from a, from a financial perspective. Well, what happens if you exceed that aim in growth? Well, you know what? The NSBA is, is, they don't expect us to get even close to that kind of, um, you know, more than eight students. Um, and if there are there a number of schools that have built a building based on all their enrollment projections three years down the road, they were proud of it. Um, but you know what? From all the numbers that NSBA has and some of the statisticians have, those, those days, are, I don't know if they're old, but they're certainly not going to show up for a long time. So um, they're not expecting those growths to happen. But the age students, they're certainly assuming that's plenty of buffer for any kind of growth. Yeah, but. I've heard said that this year actually is the peak of the baby boom children going to college. So that, that makes you think that there's actually a population decline in the school system coming. And how, how significant is that at all, do you know? Or? Um, I don't know how significant, but I do know is that over the last, I want to say three years, um, the state numbers have indicated that across the state, student population is going down. Across, not, not only in the upper grades, but also elementary. Upper grades, not as much, because as you say, you know, the baby boom population has just kind of moved out. But the elementary schools are starting to go down. Like I said, a couple years ago, maybe three years ago, the birth rate in both world and Berlin and Wales had just tanked. And then when you look at the projections that NCA has, they've got us to the trend, and they've got this huge dip, and then they've got us to flat, and the flat is 560. So they have to take an attitude survey. Okay. Um, okay, these are uh, a handful of questions that come up a lot. Aren't sixth grade students too young to be with high school students? One of the biggest problems with sixth grade students riding on buses with older students. That comes up. Won't sixth grade students have trouble with the non schedule? So, kind of what we have and what we're dealing with, sixth grade students are absolutely too young to be with high school students. You know what? So are seventh and eighth grade students. And we do have seventh and eighth grade students mixing with high school students. We have some. Okay, what happens in the sixth grade? We have some. And we're working on that. Again, Mike Bob is really working hard to make sure we do that. I have a quick question.
question about that. Um, one of the things that I really like right now is my daughter's able to take high school level math courses. Is that going to be stopped in this new model? Um, absolutely not. If we've got a student, I mean, that's one of the really nice things about having a school in the school, one building. If we've got a whiz kid that can take high level math, then they can. What we don't want to do, what we'll have to do is make sure that the schedule matches. And we'll have to make sure that that student sets the schedule. We'll have to make some special circumstances to allow that student to take advantage of that. Um, but the other thing we do, most of you, I think, when I was in your group, and I asked how many of you taught high school classes, everyone but one raised their hands. So that's one thing that we have to kind of manage because we're kind of pulling this group of middle school teachers out of the middle school and teaching high school. Mm -hmm. I think it's a benefit to that. I think it's great for our teachers to see you know, not only a group of students that they're teaching, but a couple years up the road, you know, what they have to be responsible for, but also the other way around. But we've gone, I think, a little bit too far with respect to that. So, no, we don't want to stop that. We want to take advantage of that. Mike? And the goal, you know, the goal is that every eighth grader is, or that the vast majority of eighth graders are taking algebra one, so that in, when they go into Even their ninth grade year, they're taking geometry. We actually have, um, I'm very impressed, we actually have a number of seventh graders who are taking algebra one. That's what my daughter was doing last year. She's geometry in geometry now. This yeah. is what your child's doing. Yeah. Taking geometry in eighth grade, and by the time they get to ninth grade, you're taking um, algebra two. That puts them on track for um, their sophomore year to take pre-calc, their junior year to take, um, they can take AP Calc AB, and their senior year to take AP Calc BC. And a number of students are on that track. I think we actually have 31 seventh graders in Algebra 1 this year, which is unbelievable. I've never seen anything like that. Um, you, you know, usually a lot of principals are, at, at the high school level, are worried that not enough eighth graders are taking Algebra 1. We, we actually have a lot of seventh and eighth graders taking out the one. So it's really good numbers, and that's something that we hope to even see um, increase as we move forward. So we're all, already working on the master schedule. Mike has a um, scheduling team in place. We've got, as I mentioned earlier, a pretty traditional high school schedule with every single student in the building. There are a lot of different ways we can schedule classes, block scheduling. Um, provide some flexible scheduling for middle school, which is one of the models that a lot of people like to see. Um, in short, middle school and high school students are not scheduled together, especially in physical education classes. We're already working on that. Reduce, eliminate study halls, and replace more options, both academic and elective. When I first got here, I was in how many study halls we had. We really have way too many study halls. And I know that some students need study halls, I understand that. But we've got way too many. We've, again, we kind of went overboard. We need to back off of that and make sure students are actually um, spending most of the time in school in academics, learning, extracurricular, whatever that is, but you know, not in study halls. Um, it might be needed to work on that as well. Um, middle school is a study halls, university. Uh, increased time in learning and work toward different schedules for middle high school. We'll talk a little bit about that. Um, Mike, do you want to say any more of that? I was at Butler. <laughs> <laughs> He's at study. <laughs> yeah. Uh, yeah, I mean, there's a, there's a huge, I mean, it's, it's a daily conversation this year is, is what to do with um, the 48 minutes, seven period per day um, schedule to really, um, to really become more of a modern, innovative um, schedule, you know, we also have the middle school there, um, so we have this very uh, active scheduling committee that um, has, as its um, chair of it, is also the um, president or the co-president of the Teachers Association at Toronto. So it's nice because whatever the scheduling committee does won't be in, it won't cause a, a conflict with the teacher contract. Um, and that's how uh, Mr. King, the uh, music, uh, music teacher. And um, you know, there's just a lot of conversation around um, what schedule would be appropriate in terms of 48 minute periods versus um, some extended block um, opportunities for kids. Um, having opportunities for um, some of our juniors and seniors to go out on internships and dual enrollment opportunities. Um, one of the big things this year is talking about study halls and how to reduce or eliminate those, making sure that if um, students aren't in study hall that they're actually able to take enough elective, that there are enough elective courses for them to take. Um, right now with Tahanta what happens is a student um, takes study hall um, opposite physical education. Physical education means every other day all year. And then opposite that, so every other day, um, a kid will take a study hall. 
So they're not in study hall every single day, they're in study hall every other day. And um, that would then, except for sophomores, Soph sophomores take health opposite physical education, so sophomores don't have any study halls. And, um, you know, I've done a lot of um, calling and reading and everything on what um, the DOE will count as time on learning. And, um, you know, they will count such a thing as the, what we would call a directed study hall as time on learning, where, the where it's a very structured time, the teacher's really actively engaging with the students and working on different projects and, and that sort of thing. Um, but that's not what our study halls at time of water. They're, they're basically duties for the teacher. Um, and, um, you know, the teachers could be doing better things with their time, and I think the kids could be doing better things with their time. Um, so if you actually look at um, our time of learning without study halls at Tahanto, we're not at 990. And um, so to me, that's, that is the number one um, issue right now that, that we need to fix, is to get <coughs> over 990, uh, which is the state law for um, secondary schools to, for time of learning, 990 hours. And, uh, and to get to 990 without including study halls. In the past at Tahanto, study halls have been included in that calculation. And so for sophomores, or if you include um, study halls in that calculation, we're like 1,035. We look like we're all set. But um, my perspective is, and my belief is absolutely, study halls are not time learning. Why can't all study halls be turned into directed studies? I mean, if there's a teacher in the room, and I don't think directed studies advertise <coughs> stuff that parents or children know about them either. I mean, I have to do a lot of digging to get a directed study for one of my children. But why can't every study be turned into a directed it, study? That is, um, that's definitely a conversation with the faculty this year. It's, it's going to have about making sure that um, if it's a directed study, it's not um, seen as a um, uh, extra um, course for a teacher. Because right now it's a duty for a teacher, so it's, it falls within their um, contractual. Like cover and lunch or recess. Exactly, or level. corridor duty or what have you. Um, if we make it a directed study, to, if the teacher can't sort of prep and prep the classes at the, at the desk, and instead they're having to go from student to student and help them with projects, then it becomes almost seen as a, um, a class that they're teaching or another um, preparation period that then would be an issue contractually with the teachers can only teach five out of seven um, periods in the contract. So that's just a conversation this year, is looking at that as well. Um, and, uh, so and a teacher doesn't teach seven periods, they only teach five? A teacher, is a, te a teacher teaches five out of seven periods every day, and they have two preparation periods, yeah. <coughs> and they, um, they can minimally have um, 48 minutes per day to prep, and then there would be another 48 minutes that administration can use to have a teacher um, so that would be study hall, corridor, or lunch. You have those three duties. <coughs> so all of that's in the contracts up this year, so all of that's a conversation. So that's not a state wide union thing, that's our own. Um, Correct. Yep. Yeah, I, was, I was surprised um, last year to find my son had a study hall last year. He was in seventh grade. And um, I just assumed that he was very used to working on homework and that someone looked at the there with be making sure that the kids were all working, you know, being productive with their time and possibly helping them with their problems. And you know, I found out to the contrary. So I was, yeah, I was pretty surprised. The students not always going to make the right call for study hall, especially <coughs> in seventh grade. And there, there is some, there is some valid concern out there with parents that I think needs to be addressed by the faculty, which is. Um, to some extent, I think it's irrational, and to some extent, it might be irrational. And that is, if my child doesn't have um, study hall, will they come home every night with five hours of homework, and study hall can be useful for them to get some of that done, and they have to work a job, and they have to play sports, and you know, have social life and everything. So, um, one of the things that I've asked the faculty to do, and I actually asked Diane to Sarah to take the lead on it and develop a, um, a committee to look at, which she's, she's already begun to do that, is to have the faculty um, have a come up come out of this year with um, a homework policy or a homework vision statement that will go in our handbook. It could be something that we put out there for parents that states, um, you know, we believe, um, you know, it could, it, could, it could state we believe homework should be meaningful. It should be not just given for the sake of giving homework. Um, that it should be assessed and, and not just something that's, you know, checked off or whatever, if you've done it or if you haven't done it. And um, 
that um, we actually, what a lot of schools have done is actually articulate the number of minutes that they feel like a high school student, nine through 12, should have per night on average of homework. Some nights might be a little more, some nights might be a little less. And how many minutes a sixth, uh, seventh grader and eighth grader should have. And a lot, what a lot of schools have said, have said is that somewhere around 100 minutes for a seventh and eighth grader, and somewhere around 120 minutes per night for a um, uh, nine through 12 student. So that requires teachers to communicate too when major projects are going to be due, so they're not all doing the same day. And so that, that's, there's going to be work this year with that. And I think that, that homework policy statement, with, which will have to go through school council and the school committee, um, will be will occur simultaneously to us either eliminating or drastically reducing study halls for students. Yeah, I mean, that was a concern of mine last year. And I guess I, my, it still is a concern of mine because I felt like seventh grade uh, really lacked that cohesiveness that, that I know there was supposedly a, a team, a seventh grade team, but I really felt that um, they weren't um, addressing the needs of seventh graders. And I know you've already stated that and it's a known um, issue. But my concern is how do you, how does that change with this new school? We're not, you know, uh, we're not, thinking about hiring a, you know, a, a staff for a separate office, let's say. Um, so I, I don't see how um, that will change, that, that particular culture, that high school culture given the one building and the one main staff. So I'd like to hear more about that, I'm sure I will, but. Um. Uh, you may not know that, <laughs> because there's a lot of work to be done to figure that out. Given where we are, and given the, kind of the, the, the current, you know, the combination of the current culture, the current organization, the, the way that the district has evolved, the number of years that it has evolved, it's going to take a lot of time and a lot of involvement from a lot of people, teachers, administrators, to say, OK, this is going to be a different time. We have to figure out how that happens. We may need somebody, an administrator, or somebody, a, a teacher leader, to kind of drive a lot of that work. We don't have those answers right now, but it's, right. you have to be a separate focus for that. Right. Well, I'm just thinking before that first mm -hmm. special meeting, it would be nice to see um, some concrete ways in which you hope to address those issues, right? And you're going to need to convince people that this culture will change, and the attitude will change uh, towards middle schoolers because we're going to take these steps. Yeah, I mean, I would like for us to get to a point where, and I, I agree with Brian, I'm not sure how much, unfortunately, we're so, in one month, you're going to be asked to, to make a decision on this, so, so it's, it's such a, a short time period. But at some point, I would like for um, the, the middle school at Tahanto to have its own accreditation process um, through NELS or through NESC, which will also do middle schools. Um, and, you know, I, I absolutely agree um, that there needs to be a huge focus on creating a really separate school within a school. And we're addressing some of those things. Um, like when I got hired and I started in July, I found out, you know, there was mixing in physical education between high school and middle school students. Well, we, you know, Brian, you know, basically we had a conversation and basically the next day it was, it was, it was corrected. Um, so some of these things are, um, you know, just happening almost immediately. Some of these things will, will take a couple of years to really get going. But the nice thing is, even though you're asked to make a decision on this um, in a month, unfortunately, the nice thing is that um, the change wouldn't happen until the fall of 2012 when the new building is open. Are you confident that by then you'll have a more concrete plan what you're going to do in the building? Really? Yeah. That change is yeah. going to be, you're going to move to a new yes. building, Absolutely. and all the students and all the teaching Overnight, is going to be different? Really? Well, I don't know that I would say that. We've got two years to make that change. And we wouldn't. We so wouldn't, you're going to start before yeah, that's the right. That's right. We would start. We, and as I, a couple times I've said, you know, regardless of what happens in the sixth grade, we need to do this. Mm -hmm. We need to know. Mm -hmm. We need to provide this focus for this age level of students. So we need to begin to design that. We need to begin to build into our practices how we understand middle school students, how we treat middle school students, how we educate middle school students, all that has to happen. So that when those doors open, we've got a middle school program that we can put into that building. So, so a lot of those things would begin to change over time. Some wouldn't until we have the space, but a lot of things would have to happen. Um, and again, like I said earlier, I wish, I wish we 
had like a year and a half so that we would have a track record and kind of see how we attempt and how we oppose them. Unfortunately, we don't. If the town's vote or one of the town's votes against moving sixth grade, no, I don't want to happen, but will the middle school process still be created? Yes, yes, but, but we don't think it'll, it'll be more challenging it if we didn't have sixth, seventh, eighth grade together, but yes. And those changes too would be expected to start before the end of the Yes. Yeah, and like as we described, we were already making the ones that we can take on right now with the existing schedule and, and what, what we have in place, we're beginning to try to change. Um, there'll be some major changes next year and the year after. Okay. But we do we do believe that the collection of students six seven and eight together would enable us to be much more effective in building that. observation about fifth grade being in middle school my daughter went to a middle school fifth and sixth grade in another district the fifth and sixth graders were separate from the seventh and eighth graders so you've got the same model you have now essentially if we were to take both fifth and sixth up I would assume you would have that natural break again to cluster the two grades so what would that buy us or what would that gain us with an integrated middle school because you would still have a seventh and eighth grade just like you right. have now oh, clustered right. together. Right. 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 And you would have to naturally force, you know, there would be some forced clustering of fifth and sixth and seventh and eighth. And right. I don't think that would serve this model. And that was a frustration I had in the older district that we would, went to. It would add a level of transition that we don't necessarily need to have. Uh, it would add kind of administrative uh, 
both sides are equal. Yeah. All these have no scores, critical activities. There's some interesting, actually, one of, the, one of the pieces of paper I have has a list of research articles. And one of the articles specifically talks about how important critical <coughs> activities are for middle school. Athletics, clubs, um, all of those things, because it's they begin to develop a whole different level of social skills. We got to pay attention to that, and the extracurricular stuff that we do is really not extra; it's really kind of essential, um, and it's really important to include that and understand that. Well, this is the conference that Carol was talking about earlier. Um, we have a group of six, seven, and eighth graders going on to a conference um, specifically for middle schoolers, which I think is great. Busing continues to come up as a question: What do you what? How are you going to deal with sixth graders on busing with seniors? Um, so I've been through a, um, a couple of different transitions of grades, and those are the questions that always come up. And in my experience, we've never had any different <coughs> level of issues with busing because of different grade configurations. If you've got problem with buses, you're going to have them with the extra grade. If you don't have problem with buses, you're not going to have them with the extra grade. Um, so it's really, my experience really has not been an issue. Juniors and seniors don't really ride the bus. Um, but if you've got problems with buses, I don't care if it's just on it or not, we get that. We shouldn't have problems on buses. Um, so again, it's a question that we have to respond to. We've got to have some plans for dealing with it. Um, but again, it's really not been an issue that I'm being aware of that people have kind of talked about. Have you thought about so, extracurriculars and busing? Having a late bus or? Oh. Because yeah. you can't have extracurriculars <laughs> if you can't get them home. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And you know, the funding for transportation in this district is huge. Um, and, and because of the, the large geography of the two towns, it's really it's something that we pay attention to a lot. We'd love to have a regular late bus to allow clubs, to allow, you know, being able to pick up students from sports. Um, unfortunately, unfortunately, we're not able to do it as much as we can, but it's something that we're trying to maintain. How about, what happens. How about later pickup times then? Maybe extend school day? Well, no, extend the extracurricular pickup times. Okay. Yeah. We should think about all those things. You know, any way that we can support students doing after things, even before school or after school, if we can, we should try to think about it and do it. Yeah, um, thinking about regrouping kids together based upon you know, maybe changing times or you know, changing the traditional middle school seventh grade includes sixth, fifth grade. Does it also make sense to now take eighth grade and really move them up to the high school? Because really, they've grown up a lot faster, and they're now really kind of out of that group. You know, that's, what's that? No. <laughs> you know, it's, it, I have to say, it's the first time I've, I've been asked that question. It's a great question. The other thing that's in the research is that students that come out of the eighth grade really need to be in a place where they're ready for high school in order for them to really take advantage of what high school can offer them, and in order for them to really be prepared for high school. So the eighth grade really isn't quite ready for high school yet. There's still that transition that has to happen, and the eighth grade is kind of the mark. So I would agree with Kim. I'm not so sure they're quite ready for that. There may be some students that are ready for that. And if, I mean, again, kind of the ideal is we've got them in the same building. Maybe we can have some of those eighth graders move up to some of the ninth grade classes or some of the higher classes if we can if they're, if they're able to, from a social perspective, and and if you're in the same building, you can take advantage of that. I'm not so sure that they're quite ready for high school. So, it's a great question. Uh, yeah? Just, excuse me, correct, just to speak to your question. I'm a high school teacher, I'm very I actually think that the ninth graders are not yet ready for high school. <laughs> <laughs> there's, there's a major developmental cutoff between the ninth graders, and then they come back as sophomores, and they're completely different animals. And I always wish that they would keep the freshmen in the middle school for another year's seasoning until they come to high school. Um, the question I had for you, maybe you could articulate in kind of a general way about what this middle school concept looks like. Our elementary school kids come in and have one teacher, they do all of their core academic subjects with that teacher, and then maybe go with special, but they have a relationship with one teacher. The high school kids come in, chemistry, English, 48 minutes, and all the way through. How does the middle school day look different? How do we, what's unique about this group and how do we educate them differently? What's the grand vision for that? I'm sorry. 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 I'm sor
But, for example, we do a medieval unit because the history changed to cover medieval history in, in the eighth grade. So, although they're learning literature skills in my class, but we'll focus on a little bit of Chaucer. We'll do medieval literature, um, topics in medieval literature, a pre reading book that deals with an adolescent in medieval times. History class, they're learning the history of medieval times, the early Middle Ages. Science and math classes, we cover things like uh, catapults and trebuchets, calculating the math of it. They could do uh, what trajectory of an arrow to pierce armor, how thick your armor has to be to protect yourself. Uh, our class um, can do things like the Book of Kells and the, and the special text. Uh, book of the text of the medieval things. So there's learning throughout the day that overlaps that it's all medieval, but it all ties into the frameworks and it's all still specific to our subjects. Are you saying that's what happens now? Yeah, last year was the first year we did a medieval unit, uh, and then we also did another one that tied in with art and uh, Russian culture that we're doing this year as well. So as we, one of the key things to get that ideal middle school is you need the Faculty, one, to be professionally trained on how to do all that. Uh, two, give them the opportunity to create these units. They don't happen very easily. There's a lot of planning that goes into it. We have um, time at our professional development day on Friday to actually meet and talk about who's do we want, how are we best approaching this, how is it meeting our individual goals in our class. Um, so it, there's a lot of extra planning, a lot of extra time, but it can be done as long as there's the training and the opportunity to do it. But they still do five subjects, five different teachers. Yes. And that's now, regardless. Now they, now they. Yes. Mm -hmm. But would they in a unique middle school setting? Not necessarily. It's one of the, it's one of the characteristics of the middle school is that teacher yeah. team. So you've got a team of teachers that are responsible for the students. So they and might do three blocks of teaching a day or three blocks of, okay. But the state does require you to be certified in a particular so you would have experts teaching a particular subject. Like for example, I'm English, the science teacher is an expert in science. So we have our own skills and expertise that comes into it. And that best helps the students because they're getting the best experience for them. So their team would have five teachers. Right now in the eighth grade, the seventh grade we do. So the elementary school, for the most part, one teacher is kind of primarily responsible for the class of students. In the high school, you've got a whole collection of teachers, some of specific responsible for the students that walk in their door for that period of time. The middle school is somewhere in between. In the middle school, you've got a team of teachers responsible for all the students. And one of the things in fact related to the ninth grade, in addition to Not 
Yeah. Yeah. I mean, so I mean, we could certainly you know, spend more time talking about this, but the design of the building to include educational space as support for level programs, team teaching, collaboration, advisories, project based learning. There are a lot of things that are specific about the middle school program that we can identify and to the extent that we can describe. So, yeah, that's, I think that's what we got. We try to do that. Yep. The middle school program you're, you're looking to do, would these kids physically change classrooms, claim, change peers in the class and everything else yep. from the 6th and the 8th grade? Yeah, sure. Yep. There, there are some schools that have them be in, you know, in the 6th grade, there's two or three classes that they change. And the teacher, there's a math science teacher and a history and English language arts teacher. In the 7th grade, there are a few more teachers that are responsible. By the yep. time of the 8th grade, it's much closer to a high school. There are some that kind of maintain the same level of teacher to student as they go through the middle school. There's a whole variety of ways that we can do this. Um, and From a personal level, I like the way it is. <coughs> I'm starting to become a better student by getting out of the classroom every class and switching okay. classes. I think that's important. But the other question I have is this, the grade that this is going to impact would be the third grade now, if I'm understanding <laughs> that. Yeah. Yeah. Yes, that's right. The third grade right now. kids that's in that class. That's, that's right. the smallest, <laughs> that's the smallest <laughs> class in school. They're going to all get off switch right. classroom. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, but the good thing is, the third, the third, the third grade, yeah. Yeah. if we begin to do the things that we're talking about, yeah. by the time your third grade gets to the sixth grade, there'll already be some activity along those lines. By the time that student gets to the seventh grade, he, he or she, he won't be walking into a high school kind of a schedule, he'll be walking into a middle school kind of a schedule. So there will already be a transition from elementary <coughs> in between before he gets to the high school. But, but what I'm getting at is in towns, they don't have the numbers. Like, we have one third grade class, 19 right. kids. Right. The first year will be a, so a smaller crowd. So we're hoping really proud of the most. So we have a, <laughs> <laughs> a little diversity there. <laughs> you know, it's actually, you guys mentioned that. I mean, Berlin in particular is such a small school. We've got third grade is one section. We've got 22 and 23. So. You know, another couple of students, 24, 25, in the biggest class in the biggest section in the district at 24, 25. You know, split it up to be 11 and 12 or 12 and 13, probably not. You've got a really big class for this district. So that's a challenge. When, the, when you end up with all of them, it's much more efficient. You've got teachers that are working together. And you actually, even though we're so small, the economy of scale actually works in the students, uh, benefit of the students. So, um, yeah. Um, so here's some other things up there. I'm sorry, what's your name? Cornella. 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 I almost hear what you're saying is you want to almost have a sense of a concrete, like take, you know, um, Katie, let's say just make up the name Katie Land in the first place. What would this child's day look like if she were a sixth grader at Tahoe Regional Middle School? And what would the seventh graders' day look like? Um, and I wonder if you could work something like that, kind of a hypothetical, um, you know, knowing that some decisions haven't yet been made yet, with schedule changes at the high school or just at the at, at Tondo, um, you know, kind of a day in the life of. Yeah. To give parents a concrete um, sense of what things right. are trying to look like. And the transition into the school, how will they be um, really guided into this new environment? How are they going to be, um, yeah, uh, just yeah, guided through this process of changing classes? What, how are they going to um, uh, know their expectations? How are they going to be presented? And, and then, you know, how does that change? Look at the year also, and, and then how do these things change? And then how are they preparing now for eighth grade? Just how are we shaping these kids? And how are we transitioning them here? And how do we transition them out of eighth and so perhaps at, the, at, the, at that November meeting, we could actually have a couple of slides to walk people through some of that stuff. How is it going to be different from now? Yeah. I think a better way would be, how is it now? Yeah. And what is it going to be? Yeah. Yeah, the comparison. Yeah, yeah that's good. Okay. Or ideally, um, how would you like it to be? And just so people know, when we, um, some of the initial conversations with the architects and this stuff is all in there too, but because of the cafeteria size, and if we build the cafeteria, you know, so big that we have to take away from other places, one of the conversations right now that looks like is, is probably going to happen is that sixth and seventh graders will eat lunch together, 
and then eight and ninth graders will eat lunch together, and then 10th, 11th, and 12th will eat lunch together. So um, you wouldn't even have to worry about your sixth grade child being in the same cafeteria with an eighth grader. And of course, there would be zero mixing um, between <coughs> sixth and seventh and high school. So that's something we've already addressed. I just I want to make a comment, or now we're saying something about you know getting the kids ready for the next step and changing. I think kudos to Patty and Dad Ty, um, Patty and Martin and Ty. I think they do a great job already in sixth grade here, getting our kids ready for seventh grade. The expectations are higher in sixth grade than they were in K through five for the kids that to take on a lot on their own. So I think that whatever they're doing, they would need to kind of make sure fifth grade picks up and starts doing so that they're, you know, because it'll be in their hands to have the kids ready for that change. But I think Patty and that for us have to do a great job getting the kids ready for the changes that happen when they move up there. What are your feelings on moving up to the high school? <laughs> What's your feelings on moving up? Well, I think that what Brian had said earlier um, about the sixth graders, um, or I think it was you, Brian, who said, that, you know, they're ready. And you had said, you know, eighth grade is not ready to go in with high school. Um, I think we see that sixth graders are ready. We see it in the beginning of the year. Mm -hmm. And we cannot provide them with that middle school setting the way we're set up here. Um, we can try. Um, but I think the opportunities that we would have in a middle school setting would just be beyond what we can offer them here, and I think it would give them that opportunity to grow educationally, socially, as far as they could, you know, much better than they can here. And I'm not knocking what we do here at all, but I think um, it's, a, it's tough to offer them all those other opportunities that they really should have when we're set up in an elementary school and there's just two people. There's just the two of us. So you're both for this? I'm very comfortable yes. with the thought of sixth grade moving into a middle school setting. Yeah, I think it's an ideal thing for these kids. From a parent's point of view, I think that's important to bring up at the town <laughs> meeting as well, yeah. that you have the support from your sixth grade faculty. Great on this. That's great, thank you. If I could just add, as a, middle, a teacher in the middle school already in Wisconsin, that we're very excited also about the sixth grade coming because we want to have a stronger presence in the community. Um, there's a lot of things that we can even try to do within the sixth, seventh, and eighth grade throughout all the grades. So I'm here kind of like on behalf of my eighth grade team and, and some of the seventh grade team members. They want to be also to express that they're very excited about the possibility of the sixth grade coming up. When you talk about the sixth grade moving up, um, is it guaranteed that our wonderful sixth grade teachers are going to be able to move with those sixth graders? We get right at first we, are, we are hopeful that they will. They're terrific sixth grade teachers. We've already done a lot of work with the connection between sixth grade and seventh grade. We would love for that to happen, but it's up to them. So there, there are some choices that they can make, um, which we're not going to force them to. You know what's interesting is um, when we first started to think about this, that was one of the questions that came out, we just automatically assumed that, so teacher salary schedule in Berlin is probably one of the uh, more generous ones in the district, but there are some other things that the contract has, doesn't have that others do. When you actually take those two, their salaries and what they get, and you move them into the hospital with the right amount of years, we're actually only a couple of grand away from where they are here. And we would be willing to negotiate with them to make sure that they're certainly not losing any benefits. Um, so we're actually a lot closer than we thought. It wouldn't have to be a, um, a financial impact at all. Which I was surprised at, to be honest with you. Don't believe me. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh, we, we've talked a lot about this. The notion of a school within a school is really important. Make sure that that middle school has its own identity. It'll be a school, but it'll be within another school. But it'll be its own school. Really Will that school have its own name? You know, that's a great question, though. The Rebecca in the back, uh, Boyle's School Committee member, would love to have the Honda have its own name. Sorry, the Honda Middle School have its own name. Um, I, I, I don't know. 
if, if there's a whole lot of folks that want us to try to do that, we would certainly entertain that. There's a school, Ipswich created a, um, a middle high school, and from the get go, from the building design, they actually have a separate entrance that says Ipswich Middle School, and on another entrance that's got Ipswich High School. So they've got separate entrances. So there are different ways of making sure we create that identity. Um, I don't know that I feel as strong as Rebecca that we have to have that, but it's certainly something that we can think about. It's one of the things you may have noticed instead of putting, you know, I have to haunt the middle school instead of to haunt the middle high school. You know, everybody says to haunt the middle high school. Unfortunately, one of the things that happens is that often what we say is to haunt high school. Yeah. Middle school just gets lost. So I think that these, some of these little things happen a lot and it just says there's really not, there's not that identity. So well, it I mean, may I be something that we want them to have their own identity. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. The kids leave here in sixth grade. We're king. That's yeah, that's and right. They get down. They need a place to be king again. <laughs> <laughs> but if you've got to pick a new name, it's going to take longer than building the building. <laughs> <laughs> that's well, not going to happen. That's, that's not going to happen. Maybe when we get in there, we get the feel of it. We got the then you. Yeah. What? What? Can I say something ironic on that? Oh, Ironically, one of the things I looked at when I was thinking, gee, we could name it, I looked at some of the geography. One of the water features in the reservoir there is Lord's Cove. So if you want a king, you could get a lord. Because <laughs> I was thinking, you know, quite a geographical name. Um, so I think we're essentially done. I spent a lot more time on this than I thought. I thought we had a good conversation. This quote, The Changing World, Teach Young Adolescents. I love that. When I talk about life, when I talk about school, I mean, they, they're just such a great collection of students. I learned so much from them. Um, this is actually the opening quote of one of the books that we would use as one of our guiding kind of posts called This We Believe, Successful Schools Young Adolescents. The report that I talked about earlier, the work that was done with the team, it was um, a lot of that work was fed into the, the thinking that the team did. I have some pieces of it over there. Um, I also have a book if anybody wants to take a quick look at it. It's, it's only how many pages? It's a, like 50 or 60 pages. It's a pretty quick read. Um, it actually does what you were asking for. It describes, operationalizes middle school. Um, it's the this, I'm sorry? The author? It's the National Middle School Association. It's the organization, so there's not a specific author. There's a lot of people that have contributed to it. The information about that is over there as well. Um, there's another book, Breaking Ranks in the Middle. There was a study done a while ago talking about ranking ranks, and it was about um, high school reform. And it talked about how the focus was on how we needed to do something different in the way we provide high, high school education. They took all of that work, they kicked it, I guess, down a level, and said, we also need to pay attention to how we're providing this middle age group. And so they, they did, um, developed another book, a book, Breaking Ranks in the Middle, specifically focused on middle school. Um, one of the handouts over there, the second from the left, has the executive summary. That also does a really good job of describing this, high, this middle school environment. Um, there's also another single page over there that comes from one of the books that they um, developed that was kind of to um, operationalize it, that specifically describes what a middle school um, looks like, feels like, and characteristics. And there are actually 14 characteristics that they use to describe middle school. So be sure you take some of those, um, the research as well that's on there. Read through that, it'll give you a much better picture of what we're talking about. Uh, I guess I have a couple of points. Okay. Right. <laughs> 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 That's not yet, but it will be. Uh, we had, I thought we had that report, which has a lot of those FAQs online, but I'll double check that. One of the things about the online, I don't know if people have heard. Website stinks. What's that? <laughs> website stinks. You got it. We agree. Absolutely. Um, kind of news, stuff is it was kind of a good news, bad news. Um, the good news is the company that we are using to develop our website has gone belly up. So it means we're forced to change finally. So we're going to have a brand new website, back end, a whole new facility. Bad news is it's going belly up October 15th. Oh. So we're, we're working really hard to have a whole new um, website environment. It's going to allow teachers to do you know, online curriculum, well, not curriculum, no, lesson plan development, um, shared district calendars, which we are in desperate need of. So hopefully over the next several months, we'll have a very different um, <coughs> information management 
facility, so we're working hard on that. But I agree, the website does it. Um, so we're a little hesitant to put a lot of documents on it right now. Uh, if you send me an email, I will send to you as much of, you, of this electronically as you want. All of that, almost all of that is electronic, so I can fire it off. And my website, my web, my address is on the very front. I'm just thinking from a communication standpoint for everybody else between now and November. Yeah. I know. Yeah. Okay. Uh, Central resources. So in this page, we've got not only ones I mentioned, but a few others. The work by the sixth and eighth grade middle school team. Terrific work. Make sure you pay attention to that. And oh, so we already talked about this. This is just a review of why we think we're here. City, they were city schools, they were large schools. No, they took those school. out. Those are not included in the study. There are no city schools in there. And did, did, it can, you describe the, the, can you describe when the kinds of schools that they took them out of? Were they, were they K to 6? Were they K to 8? It was, I mean, it was K to 6 and versus, versus having 6 to 8 in there. But it also, at the end it says, decades ago, the middle school movement was launched on the basis of plausible speculations concerning potential benefits, but without much direct evidence on the effects of student behavior and performance. As it turns out, moving sixth grade out of elementary school appears to have substantial costs. The best school configuration in which one incorporates the adolescent grades is now being reconsidered by policymakers and experts. And our, result, our results suggest that middle school configuration brings seventh and eighth graders into regular contact with sixth graders is problematic. And I know you say you're ready, but I think, and I, I just think this from when I was in sixth grade, which again was not very long ago, <laughs> um, that you're ready because you're a big honcho here, and you're a whole different person as a sixth grader in elementary school, and you are king of the school. I remember very, very distinctly feeling that. I really do remember that. But if I were that sixth grader in, to Honto, I wouldn't have been that. I wouldn't have had that. I would not have developed the self confidence that I did develop in sixth grade. I disagree and with that because I think you would feel king in fifth grade. You're going to mature quicker. No, 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 no. <laughs> no. The point is the sixth grade mind is at a certain point, and, and it delves into that as, as um, quite in depth in the it's study. I think on the student. The, the, oh, of course, of course. You know, somebody here could have a pit bull and it would be the best thing in the world for their second, for their, you know, two-year-old. But yeah. 
But in general, your mind, the, the development of the brain of a sixth grader is at a certain level in general, and it does best in this atmosphere versus the seventh through the eighth. So um, I recommend that you pick up, I think, the very last one on the pile, mm -hmm. which actually is a piece of work that took a look at um, many, many, many studies of great configuration. and. I know this. I'm, 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 I'm actually good. One of the reasons I'm really familiar with that study is because Mr. Ellis brought it up to us about a year ago, I think, or so. And so we looked at that study. We wanted to make sure that what it was talking about was consistent with what we're talking about. And, and our, our, if, if you read that, I mean, my sense is that it's not consistent with the kind of great configurations that we're talking about and the change that we're talking about. But the other article that, that's over there takes a look at um, a whole variety of studies and essentially, and I've been this was also found by a number of others that did some macro studies across grade configuration. The only student achievement impact that happens with grade configuration is when you add numbers of transitions. Through all of the rest, they don't really have conclusive research to determine whether or not it does or does not. But we're not really adding another transition. We're just moving one transition from one to another. So I guess I'd suggest read that a little bit more closely and then compare it with what it is that we're talking about. I think you'll find that it's that they're talking about a different set of schools in a different kind of a situation. Um, but thanks for bringing that up and read that one. No, no, don't discount it, but pay attention to make, make sure that, that, what, that the conclusion that you were pulling out of that fit with what we're trying to do. I just, I mean, one of the questions you said, are, are sixth graders ready to be with high schoolers? And you said, no, absolutely not. But my question isn't that at all. I actually don't have as much of a problem with that as my sixth grader being with eighth graders. <laughs> so eighth graders are just, okay. uh, oh, I know. <laughs> <laughs> I'm flying tremendous. You know, they're the worst for sixth grade girls, especially for, I think, they're watching. But I think, you know, I mean, the whole setup the sixth grade would be, I think the benefit the sixth grade coming up is the sixth grade teachers can collaborate with what's going on in seventh grade. We can align the curriculum there. The seventh grade teachers can talk to the eighth grade. We can all talk about, you know, looking at scores, what are weaknesses of students, how are we approaching it? You know, did, are we still seeing same weaknesses every grade? Can we cover it? How do we cover it? It's not necessarily that the sixth grade is going to come and hang out with the eighth graders. There are many indications that there's an event but on a daily do basis, that all here. the sixth grade will be the sixth grade, the seventh grade will be the seventh grade, the eighth grade. And the other thing is that if there are discipline issues in the eighth grade, we need to deal with the discipline issues in the eighth grade. Okay. I, I taught eighth grade. I understand. I understand. <laughs> but it's that's what we're here for. That's what we that's what we're supposed to be doing. I think you'll find there's the least that are sixth graders in this building to the younger students yeah. as well. So, you know, because they feel they're the top dog, they feel they can do anything. And they're just as much bullies to the younger students sometimes. And some of the largest issues I think this school has had were sixth graders that caused problems. Knife in the building, things being brought in that shouldn't be here, um, language, things like that were the sixth graders that caused problems in this building as well. And I'm not still, I'm not fully for the sixth grade going up there. I think there are a lot of changes that have to happen at Tejanto before I'm comfortable with seeing the sixth graders come up there. But I think that you know, if you want to talk bullying and you want to talk about who's mature enough or not, I think it's a fine line. I think no matter where you cut it, there'll be issues in either way. Just like that, that transition from eighth to ninth grade, I mean, the middle school people say, no, they're not ready. So how can they say the sixth graders are ready? You know, been what about the transition from school to life? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Nobody's ready. Right. <laughs> 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 I think it's important. Two years later, they want to back. Yeah. I think it's important to recognize that the sixth graders developmentally are very different from seventh graders. And there's a lot that happens between those two grades. <clears throat> and, and I think before we can feel comfortable with this change, we need to be sure that not only are we addressing the academic and the curriculum issues, but the developmental issues that these kids really will have presented with this new format. That someone, um, that, that again, we're trained for it, we understand it. And, and you know, if you show that, yes, we're looking at these things, and this is how we're going to address this issue, and we acknowledge that there are differences, and this is what they are, and this is how we're going to address them, then I think you can make people feel very comfortable. Um, and I know I brought this up, up at Tahanto, and, and I still haven't called the prosecutor's office, but when we were here for the Internet Safety um, Seminar last year, um, after the seminar, 
one of the things that uh, you know, we were talking offline with, um, with one of the prosecutors that worked in the office, and, and she had heard that you know the school was anticipating sending the sixth grade to to the high school, and and had very um, serious concerns about that, and said you know at all costs do what you can to not to to not let that happen. Now I can't tell you what her why she said that, what she was basing it on, and I. I haven't looked into it myself, but it does concern me enough where I think I, I will pursue that. I'd like to know why she said that, and um, I'd certainly be happy to provide you with the information. But um, you know, I don't know if it's just specific issues they have found, you know. But I don't, I don't know if it's just inner city issues or what. But it's yeah. probably worth looking into. Yeah, you have to get something for it, I'll be interested to do that. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll put it on it. Other questions, comments? I think the, the one observation I have about this is having come from other school systems that were much larger, no matter what the problems are, there's so much less in the size population we have just because it's much more manageable. So even if you put everybody from K to 12 in the same building, it still would never be as bad as some of the school systems that have 400 kids in a graduating class or, you know, it just, um, the scale we have is nice. There's economy of scale plus enough smallness to balance it nicely so you have that personal touch as well. So I'm not so afraid. Uh, it's something that, you know, I come from, um, I come from Norton, which is really just a medium-sized high school with 750 students, 9 and 12. And so it's roughly per grade double the size of, of Tahanto. Yeah. And, um, you know, I, I'm struck every day with, um, the other day it occurred to me that, um, that in Norton, I would say, hi, how are you doing, or good morning to a student, and they would say, um, hello back. But at Tahanto, what happens is they actually will say, hello, how are you, back. They, they actually take it one step further and actually are interested in how I'm doing, instead of just saying, I'm fine and walking along. So I think there's a politeness everywhere you go, but, um, well, except for probably some schools that are huge. But um, but you, the, I mean to say that um, to say that Tahanto is a small school is almost an overstatement. It is tiny, and um, the you know one of the I think it was Peter Dory that said you know you know there's some other school not too far from us that's considering putting metal detectors in, and our biggest problem is whether we allow kids at snack time to eat granola bars. <laughs> And um, you know, there, it is a, it is an unbelievable climate of culture in that building, and I think that there's a perception out there among um, some parents, unfortunately, that don't have kids at Tahanto, but that have younger elementary kids. That the that um, students at Tahanto are at middle school middle school age are beat up on, and. So I have, I heard this, and I keep asking middle school students in my building, do you, what is your sense of the high school students? And either they are ambivalent because they don't know any high school students, or they um, never see them or interact with them, or whatever. Uh, but mostly, mostly what I hear from them is that um, they, they feel like, no, there's not any problems at all. In fact, they feel like they're kind of um, taken care of, or high school students will some, some kind of take them under their wing and look out for them. And often they have an older sibling that's in the building that's you know, checking on them and such. So um, it, I think it already, it, it already if, if this vote doesn't go in November, we still have work to do to create a true middle school at um, experience for Tahanto students. But I think already there's a sense of, I mean, just um, a school within a school. I think the teachers are, are doing a great job. And um, you know, and I think there's that fantastic kind of culture of that building. It's, it's what I continue to hear. And now, you know, the interview process is something I can just kind of hear about. And I can tell you, I live it every single day. It's an unbelievable school work. And students will have lockers overflowing with stuff. Today, I, I came across somebody that had their locker was overflowing with stuff. And they left their purse outside the locker on the hallway floor. I actually had to move it aside so somebody would walk along and trip over it. And in the purse was the student's cell phone and wallet. And they just it's just sitting, so there's an honor system there that is, um, and I, as a community, as an outsider, I emailed Brian in the summer, I 
trying to get locks on the water. <laughs> this is ridiculous. And um, you know, we're gonna have to pay for locks and nobody uses their locks. And um, and I think Brian did respond to that. He figured out, I'm just gonna let Mike figure this one out. <laughs> and um, it's a, it's unbelievable. The the kids don't have to lock their lockers. It's like you're at um, some small New England liberal arts college that has an you, know, you can go take your test out on the, the dock and At least they'll have information um, from which they can make those decisions. So. Brian, one of the things I know I've discussed with you already, and I'd like to see some feedback from you guys on how it will change, but I think one of the biggest things, having kids both in the middle school and the high school that needs to change for the middle school level is communication from the school home. It's one of the biggest things to me that the school is lacking. Um, because you're expecting those kids to communicate a lot to us, and especially if you move those sixth graders up there, they're not going to communicate back, communicate it back to home. And I think that has to change. It's not existing. The eighth, grade, the eighth graders don't. Nope. The eighth grade this year is so dead, and we want to establish a calendar. We all have our own pages, and they're all linked together. We can actually go through his, uh, his, the school website, his school website. The, the eighth grade does. The eighth grade does. Yeah, but the eighth grade does.